lecture. Um, I have one question regarding uh, your epistemology. You speak of this uh, uh, ecology of knowledges, which is an alternative to the monoculture of Eurocentric science. Now, my question is this, and I've been wondering about this for a while. When we finally get this ecology of knowledge, how do we then know which of these knowledges are actually useful or actually valuable? How do we know that one person's knowledge is actually valuable and another one is not? Do we even know? Is it all relative? Or are there some criteria that we then use to distinguish between what would then be knowledge and not knowledge? Or is that distinction even present at all in the social sociology, ecology of knowledge? Thank you. We can probably collect two or three questions and then I ask them. <coughs> Any more of this over there? First of all, I would like to uh, say thank you for a really great uh, presentation, a really great lecture. Um, and I wanted to ask, uh, you talked about patriarchy and also that patriarchy within the movement. Uh, the other day was too, uh, we were having a, a discussion regarding the European Student Union, where they actually took five patriarchy. They asked, uh, they have a gender balance. Um, a mandatory gender balance in the in the board, meaning that the board has to be 50% women and 50% men. Is it a good solution to fight for patriarchy to actually recognize that there is actually gender? Or I mean, it's, it's a good procedure because you're actually in this way recognizing that there's actually gender and there's a gender distinction. Or should you actually just find a middle? Uh, Proposals like gender balance and this organization. Does that make sense? Yeah. One more. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about the current negotiation process of the TTIP trade agreement between uh, Europe and <laughs> the USA regarding the modification of colonial processes. Mm. A woman, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hi, I'm Teresa. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, that was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have a question. Uh, please, yeah. Out of the sense of her purpose, things I have to do. I was wondering if you see an, um, an urban bias in regards to where important decisions are taken and where important knowledge is generated. I have a feeling that. Uh, sort of uh, capitals and big cities are the place to be and where, it, where it's most sort of um, justified to be. And, and so if, if you're living, well, we're a university that's not in a big city. We're a university that's actually rural a, a little bit. So is this university less legitimate because we're not in, in a big city? And are the people who are not living in the city less legitimate than the people who are living in the city? Mm -hmm. Okay, do you want me to answer this set? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the, the, very, the, all the four questions are very good questions. The first one on the college of knowledges. Well, no, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, usually that's the, the question. I mean, if you bring a plurality of knowledge, then you are trapped by relativism. You know, anything goes. Title of Bob Fire Ravens uh, book on its knowledge, and therefore there is no other way of distinguish among knowledges. From a critical theory, and that is to say, for people that are interested in the emancipatory type of social transformation, relativism is out of question. I mean, you, you cannot equate all kinds of knowledge. So you have to bring all kinds of knowledges, but then you have to accept some criteria, and the criteria are political. That is to say, if I want to go to the moon, I need scientific knowledge. If I want to preserve the biodiversity of Amazonia, I need indigenous knowledge. 
So for different purposes, I, de I need different knowledges. And therefore, you have to bring what uh, the, a great American philosopher, John Dewey, uh, developed as the pragmatist. And before him, William James. That is to say, in fact, knowledge in our society is what neoliberalism is doing. It's, it's knowledge for the market. I mean, they are very pragmatic. And we have not come up with the idea. That's why you are so defensive. Because they say knowledge for the market, then we say knowledge for knowledge. No, knowledge for social transformation, for a, a more just society, for a free society, for some people call us a socialist society. I mean, we have to really develop other alternative criteria, pragmatic criteria for knowledge. That's the only way you can avoid relativism. Because otherwise, you are in the liberal trap like Richard Rorty. I mean, you know, you, you are paralyzed. And in the end, you say liberal societies are the best trap. Well, uh, uh, concerning patriarchy, I mean, it's, 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 it's a complex, even the concept of patriarchy is a little bit problematic today. Uh, if you are more familiar with uh, the queer theory, for instance, right? And all the questions of sexualizing bodies. Because there are uh, ways in which today there is thinking about bodies uh, that we could call the pansexuality, in which people don't have to define their own sexes in their own social, interpersonal life. And sometimes the patriarchy is a bit reductive because sometimes it's uh, connected with heterosexuality and, you know, usual values in our society. I think we have to do a critique of patriarchy in terms of queer theory. I, I think so. But patriarchy in, in itself is something that is so material in our societies that in fact we have to fight it in the ways women with the gender identification in fact continue to be discriminated in our society. Look at the most recent re uh, reports from the OECD. Even the women that are in the same jobs get 30% less than men. A salary. So gender discrimination is very strong in Europe. Not just in the rest of the world. There are different ways of discriminating against women, but here in Europe we have our own ways, very insidious ways, because we think that they are, we are a society uh, in which uh, uh, women have uh, obtained all the rights. It's not true. You know, 40% of members of the parliament in Mozambique are women. In my parliament in Portugal are 8%. Because it was a politics, a policy of the Frelimo party to bring at least 30 percent of the women. Having said that, what about the 50 percent and all of these quotas of women and so on? For instance, in my Alice project for the European Research Council, uh, I have to be very careful in that respect because we have to be really. It's it's good, it's positive because sometimes we bring people. For instance, we have one. Uh, if you go to the page on Alice, I'll give you. I'll, I'll leave my card here for uh, for the students, and the leaders of the students can distribute it. Or, or Julia, we have and Julie because Julie is joining us in this in this project. We have, for instance, one topic is the masters of the world, people that in fact have taught something by their own practice to the world, and they are never acknowledged as such as masters because some of them are illiterate throughout the world. We are bringing in these people. Others are very erudite and very scholarly persons, like even Haldon. But in fact, we should have a balance between men and women. And I think it's very positive. It has to teach us what the sociology of absence is. Because the women are there, but, but they are invisible. There are lots of women that are masters of the world. In Africa, in Asia. Particularly in Africa, we have a, one of our books came out by, uh, by, by Verso, is that the voices of the world. Many of the activists are women. In Mozambique there are two women, for instance. Fabulous women. And they barely write and read. But they are the leaders, for instance, that solve conflicts within their communities. They are the ones that have been promoting the women in, uh, in, in their movements. So I think to have women and these ideas of parity are just part of the solution, but they are not the solution. Because what we have seen, for instance, this is also the other side of, uh, I could mention, or Mozambique or some, Afri or some uh, 
uh, Latin American countries now, Ecuador and so on, is that if women come to power but exert the power in very much the same way as men, what will we gain? We expanded the oppressors, basically. <laughs> but we didn't solve oppression. So I think that it's very important that the women's movement keep this idea that the difference, the discrimination, which is an historical discrimination, the longest in, in history, is to produce other types of leadership. Cannot be the same. Even in democracy, for instance, they are very active in assembly democracy, which is nice, it's very important. But if they go to a parliament, they may be as uh, ignorant about other things as men. So this is, again, it's tricky. It is, of course, a, a serious mistake to put a, 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 a more strict standard on women than on men. As we do sometimes with indigenous people, we think that all the indigenous people have to be pure, there is no corruption among indigenous peoples, and so on. Of course there are. There are women, humans. So we cannot put a higher standard. But at the same time, we need differences in our world. And I want to know what the women can contribute to fight against colonialism, capitalism, and patriarchy. Because some women also, whenever in power, they are patriarchal. So I'm an anti-essentialist, uh, in a sense. I, I, I always try to judge by the types of the struggle. If, if, I know that you raise your hand, but can I finish the, the answer and then I'll go? <laughs> to the transatlantic, I mean, it's the most damaging initiative in Europe. I mean, nobody on the left can subscribe to this. Because I don't know what that is. Is the, the transatlantic uh, investment and commerce, uh, commerce partnership is a free trade agreement between Europe and the United States. It's going to create the largest market in the world. It's precisely what the United States tried to do with Latin American countries through a famous process called ALCA. And ALCA was defeated in Latin America through a very important continent type of resistance. Here in Europe, we have no fight against this visible one. The social democratic parts, even the socialist parts, are in favor of this rubbish. Why this is wrong for us? Because it's basically the multinational corporations running the European economy from now onwards. What they want basically, and if you look to Brussels, look, because they're very good, if there are social scientists or political scientists here, there are good art, good. Uh, uh, research projects and, and research work on the lobbyists in Brussels and Strasbourg. The multinational corporations of the United States, because they are from the United States, the rating agencies, are all of them lobbying for this. Because what's going to happen is that there are many things that is poisonous that we don't consume in Europe and we are going to consume. For instance, we don't consume American meat in, in Europe. Because it's, in fact, it's, I don't consume it even when I'm in the United States. Because it's lot, it's so much fueled with hormones that it's very dangerous. And it's proven, like the McDonald's, you know, fast rubbish that we have here. I mean, they really treat obese people and they are cancerous. Well, from now on, if an ecological movement here in Europe, try in terms of health, to forbid this type of production or this type of meat in a supermarket, or if the transgenic, well, because you know the transgenic uh, seeds are only allowed in Europe on an experimental basis. If they are going, because with this they are going to put transgenic seeds all over the place. What are the consequences for human beings of the transgenic food? We don't know for sure. But we know that small animals are killed by the transgenic seeds. Go to Argentina, to the Pampa. And I crossed from Cordoba to Rio Cuarto, and this was usually very diversified fields. Now it's just soybeans. It was the center of production of honey in, uh, in, in Argentina. The bees disappeared. So they were killed by these seeds, the pollen. So, 
Europe is going to be subjected to this. And therefore, is, this is one side. There are many other sides. For instance, the fact that if your government is a progressive government and says something that is considered an obstacle to market, is not your courts that are going to decide. It's arbitration courts based in, in New York or in London in which the arbitrators are people from the, these companies or worked for the companies in the past. So this is a disaster for Europe because the European Commission, you know what, and you have to be very clear about that. Neoliberalism would be very difficult to penetrate Europe given the political structure of different countries with communist parties. In my country, the communist party still gets 8% of the vote. And uh, Portuguese have been voting overwhelmingly on the left, but divided, and the, the right governs. This is common in other countries. But it would be impossible to have a neoliberal on, on food, on services, on national level. What they did was to enter through the European Commission. Neoliberalism in Europe, content to other countries, enter subreptitiously through the Maastricht uh, uh, Treaty, through the Central Bank. It was through Europe, and now it's converted into directives for the countries. That was the trap. And we didn't see the trap. So that's why, in time, that's why we have to do some uh, think uh, about that. But, you know, I'm absolutely negative. I'm only surprised why we don't do that. I'm surprised why the leftist groups and movements don't support it. Greece and Syriza with this very important demand that the Germans pay the damages of the Nazis. Reparations for the Nazi government. We have figures. There are courts that decide the amount. And Cities is fighting that alone. Geopolitics of knowledge. Your question is about geopolitics of knowledge, that is to say. Central knowledge, central cities, central countries, and so on. This is part of the trap of hegemonic knowledge. In fact, there is a geopolitics that you have to unravel and to decide what to do with it. What we have to do is that if you look closely, most of the innovation in science and in politics came from the peripheries, not from the centers. We are learning in Europe now, for instance, about participatory democracy in the municipalities. Where does the idea come from? From Porto Alegre, from a Brazilian city in the 90s. So there are innovations that come from the peripheries and eventually, if there is political will, they come to the center. But the geopolitics is part of capitalism, set the periphery. Well, we have North Europe, South Europe. I mean, we have all, all the time the geopolitics. Okay. Another round of questions? There, there are already two. Before, yeah, but actually, you answered it perfectly. It's just that you mentioned, um, we talked about the women who, when they get power. Mike, do you hear? No, sorry. When, women, when they get power, mm -hmm. sorry, when, when women come into power, they kind of fill out the, the spots that men were before. So we want to get the female values. The female values is very difficult to bring forward. Like, you have to enter a patriarchal society and all their spots. And that is why it's so difficult for women sometimes to push forward. My femi feminine, not feminist, but feminine mm. values are not really important in the big game. Or that's how sometimes I would feel. And, but we also have many men who have these feminine values. It's not about gender, man or woman. It's just the feminine values, I think. But you also mentioned it afterwards. So thank you very much. That was... Uh We'll take you and then I'll go back, okay? Yeah, hi. Um, when we speak of ecologies of knowledge, when we speak of inter-epistemic dialogues and intercultural translation and so on, there is two questions that I have, or rather three. But the first one <laughs> is how do we define the borders and the limits of each epistemology and the borders that separates them and prevent them to have a dialogue. Then the second question is, what according to you are the political and economic conditions for such a dialogue to take place so that it is a dialogue and not a monologue, like it usually is? And um, touching on what you were talking about, your work on the founding, founder of a social theory from Tunisia, um, 
how do we, in that dialogue, also try to find the points of interactions? Because it's always as if Europe hasn't learned anything from the world, but they have been doing that for centuries and centuries, but they just don't accept they have been doing that. And they don't want to do it now. Yeah. So that, those are good questions. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm also a part of a uh, different university, and uh, I want to touch about uh, upon, like the struggle for another university, and also as I see, uh, there is the struggle for another university is also a part of a struggle for for another society, as I see. It's, uh, it's not uh, what you call it, the two different subjects, but it's very uh, interconnected. Um, and that's also uh, like, like the, the part where we have to, to uh, be very specific and, and brought it out in a, in a broad perspective, I see. Uh, right now, we see like, uh, we could see it as capitalism, as a whole system, as also you touched upon. It's a, it's a, a historical decline, it's, a, it's basically a, a sick system. So the, you can see like the, the ruling ideas right now is to try to get profit from places you, where you didn't get profit from before and like try to squeeze you know, money out of uh, every corner of society. And that's why we also see like uh, this uh, process of uh, how business is invading the university and is trying to, uh, to, uh, to turn it into, a, as you said, a, a new McDonald's <laughs> in some way. Uh, and I think that's like that's a very uh, important thing to to remember to have like this broad perspective uh, for the struggle for another university or for a different uh, university, uh, and also just to to look at for, for inspiration from from other places from uh, uh, May uh, '68 in, in France uh, about the student struggle there, who turned into the to the biggest. Um, what you call it, the strike movement, uh, the history at that time. Also to look at the, the, the more recently uh, Arab, uh, Arabic uh, revolutions, where it was also started by the youth and by the students who, could, who couldn't get any job, who was the, treated like the products. I also think we, we have to see our struggle like that, and have to see our struggle in a broad perspective, and also see it as, uh, that we have to turn the struggle into a struggle with revolutionary com uh, implications for the whole system as a whole, uh, and and we like in this in the different university we are a small group, but you know if you have to change the university and change the whole society, you have to start at the <laughs> at some place. So uh, I would like to uh, ask everybody to, to come and join to talk to us <laughs> afterwards, so uh, we can be a broader movement and uh, be a part of the of, of uh, our protest uh, on the in next week Friday next week uh, where the 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 board will uh, will uh, uh, lay off some uh, some uh, some staff at the university. Uh, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, I was uh, very inspired by the um, ecology of knowledges, uh, but I was wondering, like practically in a sense, how to do this. I think it's super interesting, and I would like to join the struggle and <clears throat> I'd like to resist in this way. But how how do you uh, deal with other knowledges uh, in an institution where you're measured in certain ways uh, that does not necessarily carry these types of knowledges? This one over there, and then. Hi, my name is Erica. Thank you so much for your lecture. Um, I'm from California, and I grew up in a working class immigrant community. And when I got to the university, I noticed that uh, there's a certain formality in academia. And uh, most of the time, the way research is conducted, it's conducted very mainstream. I mean, uh, the education system is very, uh, it's already, you know, it's already commodified in the U.S. And so I was wondering how can we make the uh, information that we conduct as you know students, as scholars, more accessible to communities, especially you know underprivileged, underserved, you know, 
uh, communities, not just from the global south, but also you know poor communities, because. I feel like a lot of the times the language that is used in academia isn't, you know, readily accessible. And I know you talked a lot about uh, popular <coughs> education, and maybe provide uh, are there some like examples of how it's being utilized, and also how do we maintain this integrity and make sure that you know the stories that we are telling, we're not just you know uh, utilizing the same you know almost colonial aspects in our own research when we do do research with these communities. Thank you. Okay, another set of uh, very, very interesting questions. Let's see if I <clears throat> can answer. Well, your first comment, in fact, I had answered it, but it, it is true that, for instance, in this project, the Alice project, we are very much concerned about uh, non-capitalist economies. And uh, one uh, is what we call economy of care. And the economy of care has a disproportionate presence of women throughout the world. And what we mean by the economy of care, there are people that have been working on this, is uh, of course the business and paid labor and so on. But this looked up by us as forms of uh, exchanges without monetary uh, 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 transcription, I would say. Uh, based on solidarity and reciprocity. And this uh, is what we call very often the informal civil society. That is to say, the, the networks of uh, mutual aid in which women, for instance, participate so much. And what is the value of that? Uh, how do we bring that into the value system of the society since it doesn't count for the, the GDP? And what does not come for the GP does not exist. So I think that uh, that uh, your comment makes all sense. Concerning the ecology of knowledge, there are two questions, and I answer them uh, uh, jointly. Well, the first one is that how to define the borders? Yeah, it, well, it is always a problem. Uh, it's, it's a problem that has to be solved in concrete terms everywhere. Why? Because even what comes as scientific is also not so clear. Uh, we. In the epistemology and sociology of science, we distinguish between internal plurality and external plurality of science. Internal plurality is the diversity of theorizing within uh, uh, the field of science. And there are alternative theories everywhere. I mean, if you take, you know, it was, uh, take the, the work of some feminist epistemologists, uh, Don Haraway, Sandra Harding, for instance, they really uh, showed that most of the theories that were validated by, by science were male-oriented theories. And a beautiful analysis of Darwin, for instance, on the origin of species. Why competition, not cooperation, <laughs> for instance. So th there is internal plurality, you know, and there is external plurality, that is to say, between science and other knowledges. And here, of course, the, the borders are not, we have not to be very anxious about it. You know, it's the scientific, non-scientific. Because what counts as, as science is part of a community, is, is what is relevant for a community as science. And therefore changes all the time. Changes from country to country. And therefore we have to do contextual analysis. For instance, if I do an ecology of knowledge here, will be different from if I conduct it in another country. I mean, the idea of bringing different knowledge is there but what counts as scientific knowledge, there are communities that are much more enclosed as science, let's say, while others are many, much more porous. And there are fields of science which are more porous. For instance, biology, particularly through the epigenetics, it forces us to always be in between disciplines. And therefore, even the, the, the borders are very fuzzy. We are in the European Union, there was something that was very creative, uh, at a time were the boutiques of science. Uh, there was the idea that in some, even in Copenhagen that existed one, there were points in which for some project, for urban development, we put together scientists with citizens of the community to discuss conceptions of urbanization by urbanists and by citizens. So here you can see that in this case it's very clear whose knowledge you are discussing. But again, it's, it's contextual. It's, it's never something that, um, that, uh, that you can take for granted. There is no recipe. There is to say science is this, and the rest is non-science. 
is, is, is fuzzy all the time. Well, the point of interaction, of course, we have to, you know, if you take, uh, you know, you, you, you have to avoid in, in many of our studies, uh, in particular, you mentioned even Calvin, avoid anachronism, because one can trash immediately, even Calvin say, what did he think about women? My answer, yes, of course, he thought that women were not on the same level of men. But all the European thinkers at that time thought the same way. It's not because he's Islamic or because it was in Tunis, because all the philosophers that we praise, and his neighbor, a great doctor of the church called St. Augustine, you know, which is an African, in fact, and was is born in Ipo, very, very close to Tunis, right? Well, the same, for, for him, is the same idea uh, of women as, as even Khaldun. But one is a doctor of the church and the other is a, a almost forgotten Islamic uh, scholar. So, your, your comment, Jan, from our student, uh, well, I, I, it's very important that different student movements get together. And, uh, you know, one problem of the left has been factionalism. <laughs> and it's the most uh, destructive tradition in our land. We, even the left, uh, the left movements today in Europe, they don't, they have a really very, I would say, incorrect uh, diagnosis, and I'm on the left in my country, and I struggle for that, of our time. We are in a situation, you know, almost, in my view, is pre-fascistic. Hmm. I, I, in one of my articles, I claim that we live in societies that are political, democratic, but socially fascistic. Hmm. Right? So, Whenever fascism was in Europe, all the leftist groups united in a front against fascism. Communist, socialist, anarchist, and so on. Today, because we have this idea that we live in democracy, yeah. we go on with all these divisions as if, and your, your you know, most uh, important enemy is your colleague on the left and not the right very often. And this is damaging. I, I think that any Correction on that sort would be very important. The College of Knowledge is an institution that is hostile to that. It's, it's something that you have to do by, by trial and error. I mean, two initiatives uh, to bring in different knowledges in your universe. As I said, schools of law, schools of medicine are doing that for the world. Uh, in our society, because Europe was colonized so much by the idea of scientific knowledge, because it's the, from where this knowledge really was uh, transplanted to the world is very, more, more, uh, it's very diff particularly difficult to bring in this. But I remember when there was a revolution in Portugal, 74, and a democratic revolution. Uh, we are celebrating the, the fourth year anniversary of this revolution. We managed to bring peasants from cooperatives into the university to teach our students how you organize peasants and uh, organize cooperatives, for instance. So the context tells you something. And, and uh, I think we have to find ways. It wouldn't be me. The idea is that the idea that other knowledges are equally valid for different purposes. But then let, let's discuss the purposes. How do we fight market-oriented universities? Is just with scientific knowledge or bring other knowledge from the outside? If you believe the second, then you are in favor of ecology of knowledge. Then you start working on that, right? But you have to have a, a diagnosis of that. And uh, our uh, student from California, yeah, it's, 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 it's always been very difficult. And with the best intentions, uh, we have done, reproduced the system. In fact, many people, um, myself included, I mean, we have to be very careful. In our desire to decolonize, we may recolonize. That's why we have to be very humble, and that's why I never considered myself an avant-garde the theorist, but a rear-guard theorist. There's to go with the movements, because they correct us. Whenever we are doing something, because we have a tradition in, in our science, and particularly in the critical theory, that the, the, the critical theory is avant-garde. And therefore, and therefore, whenever things go wrong, you know, the fault is the, is the practice, never the theory. Well, I think it's just the opposite. So we have to really rethink theory from the rear guard. And in fact, I've learned that from Subcommandant Marcos, from the Zapatistas. Go with the movements, 
and probably the ones that go more slowly. Because in the movements there are the leaders and so on, but are, most of the people in the movements are about to give up. They are not motivated, they get tired of uh, organizational work. Go with them. Not with the guys in the front, they don't need you, but you have to facilitate the work together. So I think that we should end here, and I thank you again. I think I answered all the questions, and thank you for inviting me.